Uh, thanks, Tim, uh, Brian, and, and uh, the Morgan team for, for the opportunity to, to talk about STEM and, and what we've been uh, busy uh, in with, uh, with. I mean, it's been a fantastic ride. Um, but uh, I mean, first I'd like to just acknowledge the, the Barada Barna uh, people who are the traditional owners on the land which are our assets, the Isaac Plains Complex, the Salt Walker Creek, and the Poet Trail Mines operate, and also the Weedy people who share some of the country surrounding the Salt Walker Mine, and pay my respects to the elders uh, past and present. I would also like to pay my respects to the Ugera and Turnbull people who are the traditional owners of the land in which we, we meet today. Um, jump to the timeline. It's, uh, it's been quite a an interesting history. Uh, I've, uh, for me, it's it's uh, just I mean, just close to four years of involvement with STEM, or as, uh, as Tim said, starting at the board. Uh, we've been through a through a, a major uh, change in 2020 when the company was subject to a to a change of control. But I mean, just stepping maybe five years back, as you see in 2015, that's when the company really became a, a co-producer. I think we had, I see some of the, the original founders here from, from STEM as, a, as a, an exploration company. Uh, but quite, a, quite an interesting history. Uh, we, we really start, started producing coal in 2015, bringing the Isaac Plains uh, mine to, back to life, ramping up capacity to around uh, 2 million tons per annum. Uh, and in 2020, which is where I actually uh, became the CEO and, and moved from a non-exec role to an exec role, uh, tough time. Actually, coal price were $100 and we were actually in, the, in survival mode. So we were doing, uh, running three fleets at the Isaac Plains East, which is, uh, was mining at very high strip ratios. And, and uh, there was a definitely a, uh, an urge to, to conserve cash and, uh, and, and uh, actually what we've done is we shrunk. We went down to a single fleet and, and, uh, and pushed the, the, the business towards a uh, transition to Isaac, Isaac Downs, which was uh, a pretty interesting project. Uh, we were just about to get uh, the regulatory approvals, which uh, went all very smoothly and successfully. And, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, during that time, going through a change of control. So we were acquired by a group, uh, an Indonesian group called uh, GIA, Golden Energy and Resources. And, uh, and it's been a, a quite, a, a quite a ride since then. Uh, um, transitioning successfully to Isaac Downs, as I said, uh, and, uh, in early 2021, we got involved with the, with the acquisition of uh, BMC, which was just launched by BHP. We initially wanted to to have a go at, uh, at Port Trail, which was just next door to our Isaac Downs operation. And we saw a lot of, a lot of value, logic, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and synergies. Uh, we ended up actually quite liking the Salt Walker Creek, which is a fantastic world-class asset. And we got support from the major shareholder. And, uh, and, uh, and that's where we, we are now. I think we were successful. I think we were probably the underdog in that process. Uh, a lot of people in the market didn't believe we we could do it, but we were pretty confident that with the, with the support of the major shareholder and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the team we had, we had a, a pretty good, a good, uh, a good run and a good chance to, to be successful. So it's been a, just a year, actually. Last, last year or two weeks ago was uh, the anniversary of the acquisition, and, and uh, it's, been a, it's been a very successful 12 months, very rewarding 12 months with, uh, with uh, strong production strong safety culture, and a pretty solid financial results uh, to date. This is just a snapshot of, of who we are. We are a $2.7 billion company with, a, with a, a controlling a major shareholder in gear, as I just uh, explained. We have all the, all the major shareholders, substantial shareholders at uh, N Resources. Matt is present here today. He's also sitting on our board and, and Rigo. Uh, funds management, which is another major shareholder, pretty supportive one, and uh, and we've been through the the equity raise uh, as part of that uh, that acquisition, 
raised $800 million in the, in the ASX, and uh, it's been a pretty, pretty good ride since then. I think uh, the equity raise up was 110. We had, we had $3 as we speak. So uh, a, pretty, a pretty rewarding uh, 12 months. Quick overview of, of uh, our asset base. Uh, we are basically around the, the around Morambai, central Queensland, with uh, three foundation operations. Uh, the South Walker Creek mine, which is an open cut mine with the 20 plus kilometers of strike length, uh, low strip ratio, high quality PCI. And for the ones that are not familiar, PCI is a, it's a type of metallurgical coal, which is injected straight into, into blast furnaces and it actually has the ability to replace coke, metallurgical coke that is loaded in blast furnaces uh, to, I mean, as a, as a reducing agent and as a, as a fuel uh, into, into blast furnaces. So it's an interesting value proposition to, to steel makers. It's a smaller market, it's around 65 million tons a market, and we are now a pretty sizable and relevant player in that, in that, uh, uh, in that uh, segment of the, of the Metco market, with South Walker being one of the largest operations. 25 plus years of, 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 uh, of life. Actually, we have resources there for more than 50 years. So a really company making asset with a lot of uh, optionality. Uh, Portrail is a, it's quite a different operation. Um, it's also a, a met coal mine. I think uh, important to say that all our operations at the moment are metallurgical coal uh, operations. So 100% of our portfolio is based on, on met coal. We, we do produce incidental thermal coal from time to time uh, as, a, as a result of mining uh, higher ash coal seams uh, eventually uh, as part of the mine plans, the progression of the mines, but uh, our, our, our focus is on, uh, on, on producing and exporting metallurgical coal. So Portrail uh, is, a, is a four million ton per annum uh, operation, open cut as well. And we are producing uh, uh, two products, a primary uh, semi-hard coking coal product, and a, and a PCI also as a byproduct. Uh, while in South Walker Creek, we run two drag lines, which are probably the largest and cheapest uh, digging uh, machine in, in, the, in, the, in the world uh, in, in Portrail. Unfortunately, I think the geometry of the, of the pit and the, and the mine are not blessed enough to allow that. And uh, we run trucks and excavators uh, so it's a quite busy pit. And, uh, I think the discipline for us to turn around that mine uh, with six fleets uh, uh, and, and, uh, and keeping uh, the operations uh, stable and consistent is, is quite important. Um, it's a very piece of strategic infrastructure. We have a wash plant that can, can uh, uh, process around 9 million tons of runoff mine uh, per year. And uh, we are now using probably six of that. We are ramping up the, the millennium project, which is just uh, next door to Portrail, uh, with a small, with, it's a, in a joint venture with, uh, with M Resources, 50-50. Uh, and uh, we're gonna also process that uh, run of mine coal at our Red Mountain infrastructure, uh, uh, CHPP. Um, the Isaac Plains Complex was originally the, the foundation asset for Stanmore. Uh, as I said before, we are now uh, transi we transitioned out of Isaac Plains. We are mining the Isaac Downs uh, mine, producing around two and a half million tons per year of, uh, of, uh, of a, a semi-soft coking coal, uh, open cut as well. We have a drag line there, and uh, it's a contracted operation. So we are, we are basically, we, we run the wash plant, but we have a, 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 a contractor doing most of the mining services. Uh, so all up, we have a 12 to 13 million ton per annum Metco producing plat platform. Um, very strategic location uh, within 50K, all these assets within 50Ks. They have the, the we have uh, uh, contracts to export through the Darnpo Bay uh, port terminal, but also through uh, NQXT, which is the, the old Abbott Point uh, port terminal. Uh, three drag lines, three uh, wash plants, and a very large fleet of mobile equipment. So very well capitalized, stable, uh, de-risk business uh, going forward. In conjunction with the growth story, we also sought, of course, we to speed up our, our sustainability journey. 
uh, we actually released our first sustainability report back in, in 2021. And since then, it's been a pretty busy uh, period uh, developing a roadmap, uh, conducting emissions uh, data assessments, uh, 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 abatement uh, curve with the potential initiatives to, of course, mitigate our, our, our emissions footprint and ranking these initiatives, uh, of course, by, by economic outcomes and, uh, and, of course, developing our objectives and targets ahead of, of the sustainability report that we just uh, released. I think we just released our second report uh, last month. And as you can see in this slide here, uh, I mean, the various materiality topics will provide for us the, the direction, or the, the right direction to focus on, on the needs of our uh, stakeholders, external and internal, of course, and to ensure that we maintain our, our license uh, to, to operate. A very dynamic space and a growing importance, especially with the likes of safeguard mechanism, which is quite a, quite a challenging uh, legislation ahead of uh, any industrial uh, uh, or mining uh, business in, in, in the country. Um, here you have a, a snapshot of, uh, of the 2022 financial year. We, we are running a, 20, a calendar year. So we finished uh, our 22 uh, financial results and released them recently. Interestingly, of course, uh, the numbers you see here are only uh, comprised of eight months of ownership of the assets that we bought from BHP. But we also actually acquired uh, the 20% minority stake that was owned by Mitsui uh, in October. So since October uh, 22, we own 100% of these assets. So it's uh, some pr pretty impressive uh, results, $1.5 billion of uh, underlying EBITDA, $1.2 billion of, uh, of uh, operating cash. This, this cash was put to use uh, in a, in a substantial deleveraging. Uh, uh, we've, uh, we've done uh, almost $500 million of, uh, of deleveraging. Uh, and of course, also with the consolidation of ownership of, with the acquisition of the Mitsui stake. Uh, a strong safety culture uh, with uh, 1.8 uh, TRIFER, which is the total recordable injury rate. So pretty, pretty happy with the, with the, with the culture. I think we are in the, in the right place. We have the right assets with the right people, with the right culture and a pretty strong foundation to, to grow further to, and to leverage from. Uh, as you see here, the, quite a transformational jump in, in saleable production as well to 10 million tons. As I said, only eight months of our ownership this year. As I said, we will look going forward to be, to be producing towards that 12 to 13 million tons of, uh, of saleable production and shipments. It's an interesting market out there. Uh, it's been quite quite a ride. As you see here on, on the left side, you see the the the, the 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 volatility of the of the premium cooking coal and PCI prices in the in the past uh, 12 months or just over 12 months. Uh, it, it peaked close to $600 per ton uh, with the with the start of the of the uh, Russia Ukraine war and, and the sanctions. Uh, of course, trade flows were highly impacted and, uh, and uh, a lot of normalization since then. I think Russian calls have found uh, their way. I think they're going I mean, to China, into markets like India. And, uh, and of course, some normalization, it wasn't uh, unexpected. Um, of course, still demand, still expected to remain you know, susceptible to, to supply chain pressures, but also to subdue end user demand. I think the inflationary pressures are still there. And uh, why we see a, a bit of a spike in, uh, in coke and coal prices towards the, the end of last year and, uh, and early this year. Of course, a lot of that was weather related with, uh, with the supply, supply pressure, but some normalization is, is, is happening, which is, which is not very surprising. I think the reopening of the Chinese market for, for imported coals, including metallurgical coals, is a, is a, is a potential change uh, uh, driver. I think we should see some renormalization of trade flows. You know, some, some uh, I think of course, uh, uh, freight tends to, 
to uh, ad help adjusting and regulate what, what, what are the natural markets for the different supplying regions. But it's, a, of course, a great option to have for Australian coast, especially for the Chinese coastal steel plants that who need to import uh, uh, coal from central China, you know, you know, you know, which is usually a pretty high cost. And they are natural importers of high quality premium uh, coking coals, but, but also PCIs. Um, on, on the other hand, you see on the right side here, that's the, the margins that our customers are making. So you see here the European steel makers and Japanese steel makers, uh, uh, what, what's left for them of margins uh, after, of course, having to pay for fixed costs, which is this flat line, and of course, have to bear raw material costs, depending on the price of raw material costs. So it's, you see that 12 months ago, everyone was enjoying a fantastic ride, a lot of stimulus from out of the, out of the COVID uh, uh, pandemic and, uh, and low rates, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, it was a pretty, was a pretty good, uh, profitable period across the board from uh, coal producers, miners, uh, steel makers, and, uh, and end users like the, uh, the car makers and so on. It's, it's a different time now. And uh, of course, never good when your, your customer is starting to, to, to be under pressure or to feel the pressure. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different time, but I think uh, the normalization of, uh, of raw material prices is not surprising. With the, with the, with the, of course, with the demand side uh, under such pressure. Uh, having said that, I think we still see a, a pretty growth and a pretty strong a fundamental story for metallurgical coal. You see in this chart uh, the what's expected for hot metal production, which is the main, of course, driver of uh, demand for metallurgical coal. So that's the the blast furnace production of, of hot metal by integrated steel, steel making globally. And you have here the, the, what's, what's, what's the, the picture for China and for the rest of the world. You see a bit of reduction expected in China and in integrated hot metal production. Again, not unexpected. I think, uh, I think the world expected China to peak and in some way to adjust to different uh, growth levels. Um, and but also I mean, the, the, the property sector and uh, and the demand for steel in China is uh, you know going through a, a period of adjustment. Uh, interestingly, it's also an opportunity for actually the Chinese government to do some things like they've been trying to do for many years or decades, which is the shutting down old, inefficient, high cost, unsafe mines. Uh, so we, we could see together with that decline in, in Chinese steel production, also some reduction of, of domestic metallurgical coal in China. Uh, at the end of the day, the Chinese steel making market is mostly supplied by domestic Chinese uh, uh, coal with uh, some imports. So we, we do expect imports in China to remain reasonably stable because uh, they do need high quality coking coal and high quality seaborne market. Coking coal, it's too competitive in the, in the, especially in the coastal areas in China. Um, for the rest of the world, uh, uh, actually, we, there's a net growth there, mostly driven by, by the, the Indian steel makers, which is still, which are still growing and growing pretty aggressively. You see in the, in the right chart here what's, what is expected for the next six, five, six years around the growth in the rest of the world, non China. Uh, steel making uh, or integrated steel making, which is the blast furnace route, with India, Southeast Asia still still growing uh, strongly. All the large Indian steel makers like the Tata Steel, J JSW, the Steel Authority of India, which is the largest st state-owned steel maker in India, invested actually heavily in integrated steel making through blast furnace routes. So, still a growth story. They will demand. For, to, to support this growth, 100% of uh, imported coal. They don't have enough metallurgical coal domestically in India to, to support that, that growth story. Um, you see a little bit in, in, uh, in, uh, in the Atlantic and in, in all the markets in the Middle East. And, uh, but a bit of that decline in, in Asia and North Asia. Uh, not unexpected. Uh, I mean, I was in, in Japan three weeks ago. It's definitely a drive by Japanese, Korean steel makers to move 
into decarbonization. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, of course, a, a trend that's not going to stop. Uh, they are developing projects, uh, what they call green steel, which is mostly based on, on producing uh, metallics, uh, like HBI and, and so hot briquetted iron and, and direct uh, reduced re reduction iron out of gas. Th these processes are not new. They've been there for decades. Steelmakers have tried historically to transition to gas-based technologies, and actually it, it, they never managed to, to replace the, the scalability and the competitiveness of, of uh, the, the, the blast furnace routes. Uh, it's a trend that will increase, but again, will demand gas, will demand competitive gas, and will and, and needs to be scalable to be able to replace uh, integrated steel making. So we don't see uh, the, the blast furnace disappearing. I think there's, a, I think we see a transition, but I think it's going to be a slow transition, and I think that they will be they will be growing together. To be very frank, and uh, and I, I think it, uh, the supply challenges for metallurgical coal actually are far greater than the potential reduction of, uh, of the blast furnace route or replacement to, uh, towards more like a gas-based or hydrogen-based or electric arc, arc, arc furnaces-based uh, steel making route. Um, so, uh, but uh, again, it's happening. And, uh, and some of our clients are investing in uh, alternative uh, steel making technologies going forward. One of the comments in Japan, for example, that we, we heard is for PCI that we are now selling at $200 to be replaced competitively, I mean, the, uh, by hydrogen. Hydrogen would be, we need to come down seven times uh, to where it is now. So it's, it would be equivalent to PCI now at, at uh, $1,400 per ton. It's quite a, quite a, a challenge. Uh, especially from the, 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 the perspective of, of scalability uh, uh, and, and the likes. So here you, it's just a, another, another, uh, another angle of, uh, of how to break down demand in the different regions. And you can see that uh, there's definitely a, a growth path in, uh, in uh, India and uh, in, uh, in other markets in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, the projections for for, for what would be the natural, uh, the natural market for Australian coals would be around 38 million tons out of that sort of growth. Um, and we all, of course, we are seeing all the supply challenges we see here, uh, right? We have you know, capital exit and the re reduced liquidity, you know, the, the availability of capital for coal and a lot more expensive. Uh, we have infrastructure constraints. Uh, we are actually going through a time now of a lot of challenges rain, railing our products to the port. We have huge stockpiles at the mines. We have boats waiting at the port, paying you know, large demerge bills, but uh, with a rail system that's not performing. So, I mean, all these constraints uh, are not going to go that quickly. Uh, we have regulatory pressures uh, with, uh, of course, the, the safeguard mechanisms, approval challenges uh, to bring new projects uh, to life, and of course, labor availability and productivity. So it's not going to be easy for supply to catch up to this sort of, uh, of demand uh, going forward. And hence, we see the likes of the, the, the large Japanese steel makers and the, and the Korean steel makers uh, strategically pretty concerned with, with what could be happening in Canada, for example, with the Spin off and, and demerge of the of, of tech into a, a metco and a and a metals business and positioning themselves to make sure they they of course uh, secure supply and uh, and stable supply of of metallurgical coal going forward. So it's quite an interesting move. But the same steel makers are moving towards investments in in green steel in the Middle East. They're also looking at actually. And uh, surprisingly, investing and positioning themselves in to make sure they secure a uh, stable supply of metallurgical coal. Fortunately for us, I think, and maybe differently than some of the other independent co producers, we have a lot of options. I think we have a portfolio now that's it's, uh, it's full of optionality from exploration. Uh, initiatives to development projects or high advanced development projects 
into operational improvement projects. Uh, some of them are actually approved on the operational side. In South Walker Creek, for example, as I said before, a six, uh, a 650, uh, not billion ton, I think there's a, a typo here, I wish. <laughs> million ton uh, resource, uh, but vast development options. Uh, and we just approved the MRA to see project. It's a creek diversion project that's going to open up around 60 million tons of, uh, of low strip ratio uh, uh, resources, a lot closer to our wash plant, so shorter haulage, lower costs, and actually high in yield, higher washing yield uh, 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 run of mine call. $200 million over two years, very quick payback, and that's a project that's been supported and approved by the board, and it's happening as, as we speak. Uh, so projects like MRA to C, I I mean, th this project will see us in two years actually going down in our average strip ratios in South Walker uh, compared to where we are today. So very few operations in, in, in Queensland are blessed with the opportunity to actually in two years have lower strip ratio than you have today with pretty capital efficient investments. So uh, we are marching fast and, ex and executing fast to make sure that we benefit from, from those lower costs. Pr we have other option options like that in South Walker, plenty of optionality. And, uh, and, and likewise, we are looking at potential expansion opportunities in South Walker uh, by off the bottlenecking, for example, our processing facilities uh, to allow us actually to, to use these interesting projects not only as, a, as improvement or as cost improvement initiatives, but as expansion uh, uh, opportunities. We have greenfield opportunities like the Lancewood and Wardswell resource, very large resource, billion ton plus of premium quality hard coking coal uh, that, uh, that, I mean, of course has its challenge for, for to bring to, to life. I think we we have, uh, it's a greenfield development, so of course in development of infrastructure, uh, approvals, uh, but interestingly, I think we have uh, identified a, a, a part of that resource that we call the Lancewood project that could be a, an interesting uh, uh, smaller scale start uh, for that project uh, uh, by open cut mining, which we, we quite like. I think it's a way to start small, get going, generate some cash and help the, the project to self-fund itself and, and its own, let's say, longer term infrastructure developments towards an underground uh, development. A large uh, resource, premium quality hard coking coal that's used in, 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 in by, by steel makers in, in coke making as a as base load of their, of their, of their blast furnaces. In Isaac Plains and Port Trail, we have pretty strategic pieces of infrastructure, wash plants, they are located in a very busy location where there's a lot of action, a lot of uh, coal miners and producers and developers uh, 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 with, uh, with uh, prospects and, and, and development projects. Um, they don't have the resource sizes like we have in South Walker, so shorter life. So for us, it would be quite interesting to actually use this infrastructure position actually to leverage uh, uh, opportunities around tow washing or access to third party coal or, or even partnering with other producers in, 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 uh, uh, for the utilization of this infrastructure. I think in a world that you have capital constraints as we've, we've been talking about, uh, I think duplication of infrastructure or construction of greenfield infrastructure doesn't look very, very smart. So I think uh, we definitely want to use and maximize value of this strategic uh, position. So plenty of, of, uh, of optionality in our portfolio for organic growth and for improvement uh, initiatives. And uh, just concluding, uh, so focus for us now is, of course, it's been a year. I think we, we are quite confident that we know what we've got. And we know what we have to do to maximize extraction of value in this portfolio. I think I don't think none of us know where PCI or metallurgical coal will be in 50 years, but I'm pretty confident that in the next 20, it's still going to be there. It's still going to be well demanded, and for the reasons and the fundamental reasons of supply demand reasons we spoke about, I think it could be very rewarding for metal coal 
players that are well positioned, they have solid assets, they have the right people, the right uh, access to capital and to, and, to, and to infrastructure. So maximizing and accelerating delivery of value in this business is our priority. So a lot of focus on leveraging what we have and, uh, and uh, material, materializing value. Organic growth is an option. Capital efficient initiatives will be explored. Some are already being actioned, as I, as I said, the, the MRHOC project is one of them. I think there's more, there's more being in the oven and uh, we hope to be able to update the, the market uh, further uh, soon with, with some of those. But of course, it's always good to have organic growth opportunities for, for us to, of course, always, uh, always rank against potential acquisitions. I think acquisitions will be there. I think they, there's a change in ownership happening in the, in the Metco space with the major miners exiting. And I think we'll see that more going forward. Uh, we are well positioned to, to participate in that consolidation. We have strong presence. We have, uh, we have uh, the right operating model. Uh, we are agile, we are nimble. You know, we are fast, uh, we are entrepreneurial, and, uh, and I think we, we, we can definitely leverage uh, now and build from what, we, what, what we've built. A, cap, a disciplined capital management, I think balance sheet, maybe with a bit of luck with prices, what they are. I think we had, the, as I said, the opportunity to, to deleverage our, our balance sheet to a point that I, think, uh, I can say that we are now in net cash territory as a, as a business in less than almost 12 months or a year from, from having spent uh, $1.2 billion in the, in the acquisition of, uh, of BMC plus 380 with the acquisition of the Mitsui share. So pretty, pretty good position to be. Uh, and a pretty strong sustainability track record. Re rehabilitation, we just done 270 hectares of rehabilitation in 2022. It was our historical record. Of course, that's gonna, I think the, the, the keeping up with our rehab obligations and having a strong sustainability agenda going forward, including the, the, the reduction of our emission, emissions footprint will be, of course, providing us with the endorsement to, to do more. And, uh, and, uh, and of course, the, the credibility to, of course, to, to have our, li our license to operate uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and grow further. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, great to be able to, to share what we're doing with you. Thank you.